online training on HALT has. Our instructor for today is Stanley Pointer. Stanley is a past president of IESC who has worked in the environmental engineering area for over 35 years and was a contributing author to the IESC recommended practice for HALT and HAS. He has a BSAE from the University of Texas at Arlington and an MSAE from Georgia Tech. He started as a propulsion and thermodynamics engineer at Rocketdyne and later moved on to Lockheed Martin where he switched to environmental engineering. He is a distinguished member of the group technical staff at Lockheed Martin and has written a number of papers presented at IEST and shock and vibration conferences. Here is Stanley Pointer. Hello. We're going to start today on the basic question is what does Halton has to do for your programs? Well, if you go to the second slide, you'll see that the cover question is, it's going to give you, for electronic equipment, it will give you better products. That is, you'll have a more robust design. You'll have higher reliability delivered units. It'll result in lower cost because you'll be able to be virtually certain of passing qualification if you've done the HALT correctly. Your screening cost should be reduced compared to a traditional ESS because the time for the HAS is considerably shorter for a cycle than the time for ESS. Uh, you'll have less rework prior to delivery, and then you'll have fewer field returns. All of this is because of the improvements made in the uh, materials and workmanship aspects from, for, for HAS. All of those cumulatively will result in you getting a better reputation for your customer, which of course will improve your outlook for getting future business. For when you produce product, you want to have a quality product as your goal. So there are two primary phases during the design and during production. The overall program costs also are impacted by how robust the design is and the quality of the delivered parts. For example, if you have a poor design, you'll risk failing an eventual qualification test, which can result in loss of a program or certainly very extensive and expensive delays while you have to remake decisions that had previously been made and make design changes to bring it up to where it will pass qual. On the other hand, if you have a good design but you do not execute it properly, that is you have uh, serious materials and workmanship defects, you can expect to have uh, excessive rework during the screening phase. You may have to have a lot of scrap. You'll have warranty costs and field return costs, and field return costs are extremely expensive when an item has to be sent back from the field to be redone. Either poor design or poor execution of the design will result in loss of reputation and credibility with your customer, and that can also affect future contracts, but in a negative sense. What are HALT and HAS? Well, the, the, the acronyms are Highly Accelerated Life Testing, that's HALT, and Highly Accelerated Stress Screening is HAS. HALT basically is a means of producing a more robust design by identifying and eliminating design weaknesses and building in design margin early in the development stage. The Highly Accelerated Stress Screening is derivative of HALT and it's a means of executing the design during production to deliver a more reliable part to the end user. And you do that by ex using exposures to HALT-based thermal and vibration execution excitations reduced to half levels. And at the reduced levels, you will still be able to cause latent defects or poor materials and workmanship issues to reveal themselves, but without damaging good hardware. But what HALT is not? It is definitely not a true life test, and that is it does not test to the full scope of an environmental life cycle profile um, of a test article. It'll, it tends to focus on vibration and temperature, which are the two most significant exposures for most electronics. It's not cheap, especially if you are starting from not having the specialized equipment that are typically associated with HALT and HAS, and that is a, a very high ramp rate temperature chamber, almost a temperature shock chamber, and a repetitive shock machine to do the vibration. If you start and have to add that to your test capabilities, it's fairly expensive. Um, but if you have a large number of contracts that will subsequently use HALT and HAS, you'll be amortizing over a large number of units, and that somewhat ameliorates the 
the, the expense of buying the, out, the initial outlay of those uh, pieces of equipment. You will definitely say the main savings you'll get is during the subsequent HAS phase when you're in production, and it's beneficial to a program. A halt is not beneficial if you don't run the halt until very late in design because you're so far down the road and so many decisions have been made that lock in concepts that changing something very late will be very expensive. The highly accelerated life test, the purpose of it is to find and eliminate design flaws in order to produce a more robust design and build in a quantifiable amount of margin. Frequently now when people go through the normal qualification step, they know they pass what's required of qual, but since they never took them to either operating or physical limits, they don't know how much margin they have other than that that they specifically put in in their specification. So the purpose, you need to run a halt. You want to determine both the operational limits and the destruct limits. So you're looking for a UOL, UDL, LOL, LDL, VOL, and VDL. And the, the asterisk there is sometimes you will not necessarily go until the physical destruct limits. If you have demonstrated a large amount of margin, there may be an agreed to point, and normally you would make that agreement ahead of time, of if we get this much above our, our spec requirement, then we will stop and call it good enough and not find the, it will save the unit that you're using uh, because you don't destroy it like you do in, in many HALT tests. You use the HALT to establish a baseline, and then later you, you, you derive HAS from that baseline. You reduce the HALT operational limits by a known amount that's established beforehand, and you do that to allow a quantifiable prediction of what, how much life is actually consumed during a HAS because sometimes uh, items will fail in a screen and you need to rescreen them after you make repairs. So this tells you it will allow you to calculate a meaningful number of times that you could risk rescreening before you potentially have done, uh, used, consumed a significant amount of life. You will make a better product for less money through qual and then particularly lower cost you get into production and post-delivery. The application for highly accelerated life test is for new design of electronics boxes. You very rarely will do a halt on a mechanical device or an electromechanical device. It's almost always for electronics. You, the idea is to quickly find and eliminate design flaws. Uh, a typical design verification test or a qual test can take weeks or months. A halt test takes about a week if you use a full up with five, five samples. You want to run this early in development with prototype units or engineering units because at that point changes can still be made on a relatively inexpensive basis. If you do not run HALT until very late, then you've got all these decisions that have been fixed and you have much less room to maneuver, if you will, in terms of design changes. So whatever you change is likely to be much more expensive. You will consume hardware and the typical layout of HALT, that could be as many as five units. It does not, you may not consume all of them, but if you run a full-up HALT with all the tests to uh, failure, you will fail five units. Uh, the further down the development path you are, the more features get locked in, and therefore it's more expensive. Uh, you want to avoid doing it very late. And if it's not done until just before qual, it's really far too late because the mods to the design, if they're required, are very expensive and you've got problems in terms of uh, customer displeasure of having failed qual. It's a very high stakes test. So you do HALT to make sure that when you get to qual you will pass it easily. Uh, HALT is not a pass-fail test because it's not scored because you know items are going to fail. That's You're going to have items that stop working. So. The design is really what's being tested in, during HALT, not the individual item. You're finding ways to improve the design. The goal of HALT, again, is to improve the design by finding what the limits are and improving, strengthening the design of the unit. Um, the hardware will be consumed, so it's not considered a failure, and you know it's going to be consumed. And that's consumed as in it can't be sold, 
it can still be an engineering unit. Frequently, people who do, do qual tests, they will pass qual, and it can't be given to the, uh, sold to the customer, but they can use it for engineering units in the in the test lab. And the same is true if you've run HALT correctly. In HALT, items are expected to fail, so it's actually desirable if you're trying to find and eliminate design flaws. The reliability group is normally involved heavily because they perform the failure analysis with each failure mode that's encountered, and the design group is there to make mods to remove the design weaknesses revealed by HALT items. So those are the two groups that are particularly involved during HALT is design and reliability because you want to have a quick turnaround when you do encounter one of the limit limitations, you find a weakness and you want to replace it. You've got to figure out quickly what that design mod should be and, may, and incorporate it. And then your reliability people in the meantime are also predicting what the new reliability number will be with the modified design. HALT testing, in terms of the methodology, you definitely should have the unit under test be operating for all HALT exposures. You don't get much benefit if you have something that is turned off or on and you only get hard failures. You can find intermittent failures if you have the system operating. The HALT amplitudes are not necessarily related to field stresses. This is one of the issues that comes up in management where they say, well, we're going to see this in the field, so run HALT to that. No, you're not trying to replicate the field. You're trying to find design weaknesses quickly through these highly accelerated uh, tests. So what you test to may not be what you are going to see in the field. It will normally be considerably more severe than what you do in the, see in the field. And then the, duration, the durations of the exposures are abbreviated by doing compression uh, by increasing the stress levels. Uh, typically, you would hear of miner's rule where you're, you trade off amplitude to reduce time. Uh, when you're performing HALT testing, you typically will do the single exposures first to re reveal the design weaknesses for each exposure, and then you look at the combined exposures to find things that are only affected by the combined exposures. So you do temperature steps as single exposures, we'll do low temperature steps, high temperature steps, and temperature cycling. Then the dynamic, again, single exposure will be your vibration, which is run by the repetitive shock machine. And then you'll have combined stresses, which is the vibration while you're also taking temperature cycling. Okay, of the five typical exposures, all but one of them hypothetically could be run in parallel on separate units if you have enough test equipment. Now, that may be become a, for small labs or small companies, that may get expensive if you have to have four or five setups. But you could save further time by running these single exposures in parallel with one another. The thermal step stresses are demonstrated in the two figures here. Uh, you, you will pick a starting point that is normally uh, at your expected uh, design requirement, and you will go down in steps until you either get a catastrophic failure of the unit, and that would be a destruct limit, or you reach a previously agreed to margin. That would be the one where you say, if we're this much better than we have to be, we don't need to go further, we know we're good, or until you reach the limits of the chamber. And that, that rarely happens, but it could happen if you have a really strong unit. When you reach an operating limit, an operating limit is that which at the particular level you are at, it will not work, but if you back off a little bit or remove the exposure, it will work again. So it has not been a, a terminal failure, it has simply stopped working at that level or that temperature, and if you back up, it will work again. So when you're trying to find your, your real limits, you reach, it, it find the operating limits, and then back up one step and repeat to see if it still works or if it was, in fact, a hard failure. And sometimes you'll try op the operating limit again, meaning go back up that one step to confirm that it consistently stops working at the same point, the same temperature. And sometimes you will find cases where the operating limit is also the destruct limit and there's no recovery from that. So when you go into finding, eventually working to set up your HAS, you'll back up the step or two steps from there 
but it is it is something that you will find is on occasion the operating and destruct limits are the same value. On the hot side, it's the same basic approach. You start at a lower limit and you take steps, increase the step exposures, the temperature exposures go up in steps of say 5 to 10 degrees C, and at some point you will pass your spec requirement and you should continue up until you find the operating limit and go back down one as you did where you went up in temperature once for cold, now you're going hot, so you want to go back down one step and then come back to the top step and see if it will work, can, uh, still work at that level and perhaps maybe have one more level before it stops working. And again, sometimes the operating limit will be the same as the destruct limit. The thermal cycle stresses are not run to reproduce the failures. You're run to do a rapid change of temperature as quickly as possible and to produce mechanical stresses due to the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, coefficient of thermal uh, compression. You're looking for differences in materials in the box and find weaknesses related to that. And if you look at the, the figure is fairly small, but you want to go up to near what you ran as the upper operating limit and the lower operating limit. But you don't go all the way there. You're, again, you're looking mainly at the rapid transition, the stress created in that uh, ramp. So you want to run typically three to five cycles. You want to start with cold because you want to end with hot because if you stop cold and try to bring it back to ambient, you can get some condensation issues and you want to avoid that. Uh, the, the high temp, you start at or above the requirement but below the operating limit and the low temp is at or above the requirement but, no, that one, I got an error there. It's below the requirement but above the LOL. Uh, the function, you want to function at each of the, of the Excel of the extreme limits, and then you want to stabilize and then function the unit. The function during transitions you want to do as well, that will slow what, somewhat slow the stabilization because if you are heating by, by virtue of having it powered up, if you are heating the unit when it's trying to go cold, it will take you longer to achieve your cold stabilization. That's just an added time factor and it may not be an extremely long time factor. Uh, the temp in all of these, whether it was the high temp, the low temp, or the temp cycling, the temperature that you're concerned about is the unit temperature, not the chamber temperature. So you want to be instrumented with a thermocouple on the test article that you're using. The halt sequence normally is done as follows. You start with progressively higher step increases, so you go rapid low step increases with covers removed because you want to get the air into uh, the electronic parts as quickly as possible so you can get a cool down as quickly as possible. And you'd start at say 25 C and go in minus 10 degree C steps. When you go to high temp, you do essentially the same thing. You've got the covers removed. You start at 25 C and you go plus 10 degree steps. Uh, if you get where you think you're you're reaching your operating limit, you may want to go to, say, five degree steps and add a couple of additional steps. The vibe stresses, you want to start small at, at a relative three or three to five Gs and go in small steps of two to three Gs and run for 10 minutes per axis. Uh, and the Gs there, you will see the suppliers uh, talk in terms of GRMS, as I'll show you a little bit later. It's not really GRMS. It's just a dial setting to give you an indication of relative amplitude. The temperature cycle stresses, you have again, you have covers removed. And then the last of the exposures is the combined stress, which is the vibe and temp cycle. And on that, you may or may not, depending on your article, what your box is, you may or may not be able to remove the covers. If you can, you run it with the covers removed. Again, the idea is to cool down or heat up as rapidly as possible, and that helps you do, do that. And all but the combined stresses can be run in parallel on separate units if you have enough test equipment. One consideration you have to consider, you have to think about in HALT 
particularly, is the limitation that at some point you'll get um, diminishing returns and you have to make a decision as to whether to st when to when to stop. And that is you will reach a point where you're finding failure modes that are not representative field failures. Um, you, so you have to decide do you fix or not because sometimes they will be mixed in. You'll still be seeing some field realistic failure modes and some that aren't. And this is where reliability and design have to get in, is to help make a determination of is this particular failure mode one that I'm likely to uh, find in the field. And that can be done through a dynamic analysis that predicts modes and an electronics analysis that talks about the stresses on the electronics. So it, you can fix any particular failure mode, but it will, it, and that will improve the reliability, but there will be a cost associated with it. And if you go to too many of these field unrealistic modes, you're paying a lot of money to get a, an improvement that may or may not be uh, beneficial. So you have to make the decision, ultimately, is the cost justified since some of the modes you encounter are not field related. And then after you have made all of the fixes that you've the design, you've improved the design, you've replaced, improved the individual aspects of the design and made a more robust system, you ha ultimately have to make a decision based on all the mods that you have incorporated. You run one more test to show that the changes you made have not accidentally produced unintended consequences where you may have created a problem while improving a different one while eliminating a different problem. Um, HALT, again I mentioned earlier about the, the specialized equipment. It's potentially expensive if you don't already have the HALT temperature chamber and a HALT shaker, which is really a repetitive shock machine. And the cost of the units consumed in HALT, and you can, again, you can use up to five if you do a full up HALT. And if your test articles are something that's $100, and consuming five of them is not much of an issue, if your test articles are something that costs $50,000, you may want to try to find a more, uh, maybe not go quite as severe, try to find a, an improved design level that does not require you to go into uh, failing the units. But again, if HALT is used on multiple programs, you're going to attend, you're going to admit, uh, amortize that cost over multiple programs. The issues again, in summary, HALT has been known to find flaws that don't represent field conditions. The repetitive shock, and particularly because the repetitive shock machines excite very high amplitude, high frequency excitation that's not normal to field usage. For example, ground-based vibration typically is limited to about 500 hertz and that's things coming up through the suspension system of, of wheels or tracks. Um, Flight-based vibration excitation is typically limited to about 2,000 hertz. You cannot get a really good mechanical transmission of vibration above about 2,000 hertz. But the excitation from a repetitive shock machine uh, goes to well over 10,000 hertz. So that high frequency, you're getting a lot of energy in there that can affect the piece parts on the circuit card because the, the smaller a part, the higher the natural frequency. So if you get up into this 10,000 above hertz range, you could be causing electronic parts, piece parts, to fail that would not fail in the normal usage. So that is a consideration is to make sure you're having to make the decisions, get the reliability guys involved to determine whether a particular mode needs to be repaired or not. And then the other issue is that because of the nature of the repetitive shock machine, which is simply a bunch of pneumatic hammers hitting the underside of a table and your test articles on the up top side of the table, uh, there's an issue of uniformity of the excitation. And if you're trying to screen numerous products at one time or if you're trying to run multiple units during a halt test, you want to make sure that you have a reasonable uniformity so that each article being tested will see essentially the same exposure. 
Uh, sometimes that's an issue on the on the RS machines, repetitive shock machines, is there will be a substantial variation from a unit in one portion of the table to a unit in a different portion of the table. And another limitation on the RS machines is the size of the item and the capability of the machine. Um, if you have a, an article, a test article, that weighs 500 pounds, you're probably not going to be able to do that on, the, on an RS machine because there's not enough overall energy put into the, to the table. If you have an item that weighs two or three pounds, you're fine. And that's really what the uh, HAS is best at, is small articles that are a very high rate of production. The specialized equipment, again, is a, a temp shock chamber versus a temperature, a regular temperature chamber, and fixturing for the design for a vibration test on an RS machine is different than fixturing on an electrodynamic shaker. The repetitive shock machines, there are differences in between them, and some of those are highlighted, uh, and that's the comparison of a halt and chamber in a typical chamber. A typical halt chamber has very high ramp rates. You will have airflow directly impinge the test article if you look at those two uh, silver U-shaped, up, upside down U-shaped, those are just uh, two uh, ducts directing it onto the test article. You'll have thermal couples mounted on or in the UUT during the screen, during the halt test. You're injecting gaseous nitrogen, this is an LN2 system, and it, it can handle multiple units, whereas a, a conventional thermal chamber has moderately high ramp rates, and that is you may get to 22 to 25, maybe even 30 C per minute. A halt chamber will be 60 to 80 to 100 C per minute rate of change. In a normal chamber, airflow may directly impinge, but in most testing, you actually try not to have it directly impinge onto the unit. And if you have a thermocouple, you would cover the thermocouple with uh, high-density foam to make sure that you're reading the test article temperature rather than the uh, airflow temp. You typically would have one or two stage compressor in a normal chamber, and again, it can handle multiple units. The comparison of fixtures is, is a very significant difference between HALT and uh, normal other kinds of testing, and that is the typical repetitive shock machine fixture is very lightweight, it's very flexible, uh, as the picture shows, the black studs, the all thread holding it down, basically is the entire fixture. The, the silver part is the test article, but it's very lightly secured. And, it, and RS testing actually relies on amplification of the excitation from the pneumatic hammers and on resonances on the uh, table and in the configuration as it's mounted. Whereas if you're testing in a typical electrodynamic uh, shaker, the fixture is semi-infinitely rigid, as shown in this pit in the picture on the right. That that is a cubic aluminum, an aluminum cube with the test article mounted on top of it, and you're trying to eliminate any resonances below 2,000 hertz. The RS fixture, you really are kind of managing the input whereas in the electrodynamic, it's controlled. You actually can get very specific frequencies at very specific amplitudes as you program it, whereas in the RS, you're simply turning to, like it says, 3G, 5G, 7G, and the frequency breakdown that you get is pretty much just the way it's built in the, on the table. Uh, additional comparisons between the shakers is the RS shaker is multiple pneumatic hammers, and you manage the input rather than control it. You're randomly striking the bottom of the table, and then you can simulate all axes at once, although the longitudinal and transverse are typically about half of the vertical, and you are putting in uh, significant high frequency energy. The electrodynamic shaker, on the other hand, can have very large force capability. Uh, this unit the, the shaker that's shown here, and most of the shaker is to the right of the picture on the right. You only see the end of it, the black cone that attaches to the slip table, but that's a 60,000 pound shaker. Uh, that can shake very large items. You actually can control spectral input on an ED shaker 
this as it's shown, it's single axis, but there is now multi-axis, including three-axis systems are coming along and becoming more common. Uh, there's, they're a fairly recent innovation, so they are still growing, and you can control all three axes at once. Uh, a way to get a better three-axis excitation out of an RS shaker is there's what's called a skew table, where the table is not uh, a flat table. It'll be twi at different angles in all three planes, and that does improve somewhat the ability to get uh, multi-axis excitation of closer to approximately equal amplitude on the RS shaker. Okay, the, all of that, everything to this point has been the description of HALT. Now we're looking at HASS, which is the design execution portion of the HALT-HASS symbolism. Uh, the purpose, again, is now instead of finding design flaws, you want to find and eliminate material and workmanship flaws before the items reach the field. Again, if you have product that you have delivered to a customer and it fails under warranty, it's much more expensive to send it back and get it repaired than if you find the weakness in the assembly area and fix it in the assembly area so when it leaves, it is going to be more reliable when it goes to the field. So the application for HASS, at the start of production, it's 100% of articles. You test every one of them. You screen every one of them. You, you typically will be screening at the line replaceable unit items, and you usually would want to also recommend, uh, we would want to screen at the circuit card assembly item. When half success is proven and you've got field failures that are in what's determined to be an acceptable range, then it's possible that the sampling frequency can be reduced. And you have the reliability group and the quality assurance group have programs that you can calculate at what failure rate it becomes acceptable for you to back off and instead of doing every single unit, you do it on a lot basis or a sample basis. Um, and then if you happen to, after making that decision, if your failure rates start to go back up or your reliability rates start to go back down, you can re make whatever fix is needed and go back to 100% screening for a time. But that's one of the advantages of HASS is it does give you the possibility of being able to reduce from 100% screening to a sample screening after you've proven that you have a good assembly process. The expectations for HASS are that you eliminate the infant mortality problems in hardware prior to being delivered. And is it here it is considered pass-fail because if it fails, you, you can't ship it. If it doesn't fail, you can ship it. Uh, the ones that fail can be reworked up to whatever the, prop, the number of uh, screens that you calculated from. Remember I said you can, using HALT and HASH, you can get a known quantified amount of life consumed during the screening process. So you have to make some point of, well, we can, t we can screen two times or three times or four times before we throw it away. So based on the decision point that the individual company makes, you can rescreen and that still be delivered to customers once you once you fix the issues that were wrong with it. Now, the actual methodology for HASS, you would do a thermal survey with an instrumented unit or units, and you're looking for reasonably uniform flow within the chamber. Again, since you're going to be screening multiple products all the time, you want to make sure that you're getting more or less the same exposure on every unit. If your chamber has a hot spot because of the way the, the rapid uh, transition of temperature is going on, if you've got a hot spot, then the product that's uh, being screened in that particular location or the couple of them in that particular location will not uh, be as trustworthy, if you will, as the other ones that see a more uniform uh, exposure. So you want to be careful that you're not having a some of your products be screened at a sufficiently different temperature than the rest of them that certain ones, if it's in position one or two, say, well, those aren't, those aren't as good as the ones in the rest of the position. So you are looking for uniformity or reasonable uniformity 
in the in thermal testing. Similarly, for vibration, you want to run a vibration survey with an instrumented fixture, and you're looking more or less for uniform input in terms of the vibration energy that gets into the product from the repetitive shock machine and going through the, the table to the top and then through the flexible fixture, you want to still see reasonably uniform vibration at the location of each of the articles being screened. And on vibration in particular, you want to have uh, response accelerometers around me in close vicinity to each UUT if you are screening multiple units at once because you want to be able to control what the units are actually seeing or you want to see if they are close enough alike that it's acceptable for all of the locations. And sometimes you will see someone running a, a uh, pass test where there will be a certain number of positions and one of them will be left empty simply because they found that it was not sufficiently uniform, it was sufficiently different that they left that unit, that space empty on all future runs. Now, the screen strength is reduced compared to the amplitudes that were used in HALT. Uh, it's still going to be more severe than transportation storage or usage. The functional test and monitoring are all during all half. Again, UUTs must be functioning during this kind of testing because you can miss intermittencies, and intermittencies are uh, frequently the majority of failures that show up in electronics. So you want to make sure that you're, you're operating the units during the exposure. Uh, as an example of the step reduction for thermal steps, the various approaches, you could start your, your testing when you're doing the thermal steps and, and 10 or 15 degrees below the upper limit but above the lower limit and greater than the spec. You can also take an approach of using 80 to 85 percent of the difference between the upper operating limit and room temperature and then add that to the room temperature. So you're using most of the difference above room temp, but not all of it. And then in vibration, you want to use like the square root of or one over the square root of the upper limit. Or you could also use the approach of 3 dB down on PSD, but since that's rather, that part's rather hard to achieve because since the uh, spectrum is not truly controlled, it's hard to get a, a uniform 3 dB reduction. If you're doing pass on an electrodynamic shaker, which can be done on an electrodynamic shaker, then you could make a specific 3 dB reduction. Has characteristics, it's got a proven history of reducing infant mortality problems, which is what you're looking for. Uh, it results in improved reliability, which is going to improve your product. Uh, again, the exposures are not field-based. They're based on the halt minus a fixed amount. They're highly accelerated, particularly compared to in the uh, traditional ESS. And these, the individual screens are shorter than ESS, so you're going to save time and money if you're doing the same number of units. You'll save time uh, doing pass as opposed to a traditional ESS. But the limitations are it's better suited for low-cost, high-rate items, meaning high rate of production items, and it's better suited for small items using the RS machine. Um, again, if you have large items, you basically can't use the RS machine because there's not enough energy to excite it properly. So halt has chamber exciters are required if you don't have one, or typically required if you don't have one previously. If your facility is getting it, wants to go to halt and has, you will probably have to buy the, the uh, specialized equipment. The repetitive shock is essentially is really non-Gaussian. Its profiles are managed, not controlled. And the energy input in low, is somewhat low in low frequency band, and it's very high in, high fre in the high frequency band. Uh, additional HAS characteristics are, again, you can result in failures that are not real world. They're not things you will encounter in the field. So you have to make 
sure that you're making a determination as you find and, and remove failures, are you finding and replace, removing real failures or some that are artificial because of the way the excitation is provided. Uh, the vibration will typically vary more greatly across the repetitive shock machine table and that affects the, the unit input. So you have to be careful to find the best uniformity you can across it. Now, as a, as a brief example, though, of the savings that are possible using HAS compared to a traditional ESS program, take an example where uh, you, because each screen group will take less time to test than the same group would using ESS because you're using fewer cycles, thermal cycles, uh, the screen efficiency of temperature is dependent on the delta, the, I mean the ramp rate, the, the total delta difference of high and low extremes, and the number of cycles. So since you're having a very high ramp rate, you have fewer cycles and that take to get the same screen strength. And that means you have less time in the chamber, so less time saves you money because you're not running, you're not using as many man hours or as many equipment hours. So for high volumes, that can be very significant. As, an ex as a typical example here, uh, you have a savings of 12 to 16 hours per group that is being screened. And that group can be, depending on what you're making and, and have the chambers you've got, you could have anywhere from one to a couple of dozen in the chamber at one time. But say, take an example, if you're making 10,000 units a year and you're using groups of four, so you've got 2,500 groups and you save 12 hours per group, being the conservative, the lower end of that uh, typical time savings, you're saving 30,000 hours worth of cost by using uh, HAS as opposed to a normal traditional ESS. And the limitation on that, again, you typically can only do that for small test items. If you've got low rate production or if you've got very large items, a traditional ESS is the way to go. If you've got high rate of production and low cost items, then HAS is definitely the way to go. This is a comparison of a while ago I said that the, the vibration is not really uh, particularly Gaussian on an RS machine. This shows that, that uh, comparison. The random signal from an electrodynamic shaker is shown on, on the left. And you see there's variations, and random signals normally have about a three sigma variation from the highest to the lowest uh, value. The repetitive shock machine, as you can see on the right, is, does not really look like the, uh, the, the true random. And you can see each of these impulses. And the impulses themselves are the shocks from the various pneumatic hammers striking. And they have some variation within their ability, uh, within their uh, range. And the picture at the bottom is showing you the uh, probability density function. And you have that very spike, much more spiked on the RS machine than you do on the electrodynamic shaker. Uh, the spike is uh, fairly high compared to the uh, RS. So additional comparisons on them. This is kind of a plus and minus, which is uh, benefits and 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 lack and uh, bad tests. The RS characteristics is more realistic for items with resonances above two kilohertz, and the ED is more realistic for uh, resonance with, with items with resonances less than two kilohertz. The limited uh, repetitive shock force limits the size of the article that can be screened, and the much higher force limits on the ED makes it suitable for items of any size. You can have very large items and be screening. The uh, particular negative on RS is that the large items aren't screenable unless they can be broken down into smaller items. And the large items may or may not be tested at breaking them down if you choose to on, a, on an ED. The fixtures on an RS are lightweight, they're very flexible, and they rely on resonances and amplification of input to give you the strong test. And on an ED, the fixtures are 
semi-infinitely rigid, you're actively trying to eliminate fixtures because you want to control the very in, really control the input that you see. And then the HALT has summary. HALT will give you a more robust design of a new unit. The HALT improvement is relatively inexpensive if you do it early. The earlier in the, in the development stage that you use HALT, the better your savings because you're finding design weaknesses before all the decisions have been made and it's, you still have more wiggle room to make a decision without it being a terribly expensive thing to do. The overall test cost of HALT can be reduced if it's done early. You have, some, you have to do a final no unintended consequences test after the design improvements have been incorporated. You want to make sure that you did not inadvertently make a different problem arise. Uh, there are some costs set up with the, uh, the initial setup of a HALT and HASP if you choose to use the repetitive shock and the temp shock type chambers instead of doing HALT on conventional equipment. Now, you can do HALT and HASP on conventional equipment. You will not see as big a savings as you do doing it on the specialized HASP equipment. So there's a trade-off on that initial capitalization of how much is it cost me to do this and buy the new equipment versus how much more money will I save when I do HALT and HASP on the special equipment as opposed to the traditional uh, ED and, and compressor type uh, chamber. There are costs for the units that are consumed. If you're making a product that is not very expensive, that, is, that becomes trivial. If, like I said, if you're, if you're destroying five items that cost $100 a piece, of something that you end up selling, what's part of something that you sell for $20,000, that five items is, is a meaningless expense. But if you've got very expensive items and you don't make many of them, then you want to be careful about how you do your halt, and you may not want to go all the way to failure of everything. Half screening levels are based on reduced halt levels, so there's a direct correlation between the excitations used in halt and the excitations used in Pass, and that allows you to calculate the uh, potential life that is consumed during, during HASS and therefore allows you to determine the number of repetitions of a screen you want to have before you decide, no, this, this particular unit is not acceptable any longer. Uh, HASS will improve the reliability of the delivered products because you're finding and eliminating uh, manufacturing flaws whether that's weak parts or bad assembly or bad process, can be found and, and eliminated using HASS. And particularly if you're, work, if you're working on something that has a high production rate, you will save a significant amount of money doing a HASS um, compared to a traditional ESS. And HASS is, an, is very greatly suited for uh, consumer product items. Somebody makes a million radios a year, <laughs> you're going to be doing very well uh, in terms of savings. If you have something like on the military side where you may make only 10 or 20 or 30 somethings a year, that may not be as, as much benefit. <laughs> okay, we now have a quiz and there's a separate model for that and there's five questions in the quiz to show what you've learned. So the reference for this is actually the HALT and HASS, the recommended practice that was produced by the IEST. Uh, everything in this is derived from that document. That would be a good reference document to obtain. And there is additional information uh, in a supplement that will be downloaded with this, uh, including a simplified example of the screening costs um, and some additional comparisons of the the traditional, ha uh, traditional ESS and a HASS that were not included here. That concludes uh, the presentation. I hope it has been a benefit to you. If you have questions, you can send them to me through the IEST. Uh, they have my contact information. But uh, good luck with your implementation of HALT and HASS.